If you're seeking to buy or even construct a new gaming PC, the graphics card that you choose is pretty critical. It's also a difficult decision to be able to make because there's just so many different brands and variants of every single graphics card to choose from. So how do you end up picking the right GPU? Do you even know what and how and why to buy? Well, stay tuned. Learning to interpret numbers and knowing what's relevant is the key to being able to select a graphics card slash GPU. Do you need more VRAM or GPU cores? What's the significance of cooling? And what about draw of power? These are all questions that we're gonna address in today's video as we go over how to choose the best GPU for your needs. So let's get started. AMD versus Nvidia. If you're building a setup right now, your choices are pretty limited to just two manufacturers, AMD and Nvidia respectively. But don't worry, there's many GPUs to select from them. These two industry behemoths have had the most powerful cards and even their entry level models are optimized for HD gaming. When selecting a graphics card, there are more options than just branding, but AMD and Nvidia do offer several unique qualities which are unique to their technology. Nvidia cards have exclusive support for G-Sync tech, which works nicely with GeForce Now, although AMD's free sync monitors will operate with Nvidia. There's also deep learning super sampling, which has demonstrated its ability to increase the performance across a number of growing and supported games. Nvidia had first supported ray tracing, but AMD is now using it as well. However, because Nvidia has had a head start on ray tracing, your results with an AMD Radeon card may vary. Nvidia also boosts by far the most powerful graphics card in the market. The flagship RTX 3080 is a 4K giant, that is, if you can locate one in stock. The RTX 3090 is much better, but it is worth way more than some users are willing to pay. Not to mention there is the 3090 Ti, which is a true beast when it comes to gaming and graphics options. However, this doesn't exactly mean that AMD is doomed. Its high-end graphics cards are capable and occupy a significant market segment. Although its features set is somewhat lesser, its GPUs tend to give much better value for money in most segments. It does support FreeSync frame synchronizing, a tech similar to G-Sync, image sharpening, and other visual upgrades, all of which can help to improve the look of a game and a low cost in terms of resources. Imagine upscaling its handle by AMD with Fidelity FX Super Resolution 2.0, and Radeon Super Resolution. Finally, whenever you are choosing a GPU, think about if your display supports FreeSync or G-Sync and whether any of these firms' graphics cards' companion functions can aid you. For the most part, price and performance will take precedence. CUDA cores and streaming processors. Although both CPUs and graphics cards do contain processing cores, the responsibilities differ, hence their number does end up varying. CPUs must be strong general purpose processors, whereby GPUs must be capable of doing a large number of concurrent, yet basic, calculations all at once. Which is why CPUs have a few hundred cores, where GPUs have thousands. More is always better, but other factors can make a difference. A card with fewer cores may have a faster clock speed, which can help raise its performance even higher than cards with more cores although this isn't usually the case. This is why individual graphic card reviews and head-to-head -head evaluations are critical in any regard. You can, however, make comparisons with each product line. For example, the RTX 3080 has 8,704 CUDA cores, whereas the RTX 3090 has 10,496. The 2080 Ti in comparison has roughly around 4,300 CUDA cores, which is half of that of the 3080. However, these are two distinct generations of GPUs, and just because the 380 has twice as many CUDA cores doesn't exactly mean that it performs twice as well. It's not really how many of these cores there are, but which generation they come from. The 30 series GPUs are better fitted with the RTX 20 series GPUs, and we expect it to become more compatible over time. Tensor cores are not going away as well, so it's usually best to go with a more modern NVIDIA GPU if you can't afford it. VRAM. Every single graphics card, like every PC, does require its own dedicated memory, which is commonly referred to as video RAM. The most common format is gigabytes of GDDR memory, which is followed by a number indicating the generation. 
Ryzen GPUs has range from 4 gigabytes of GDDR4 to 24 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory, while GDDR5 graphics cards are also available. However, the importance of the VRAM as an indicator on a graphics card performance is really less relevant than that of the core counts. It does impact how much data the card can store before processing, which is important for high resolution textures and other in game elements. 4GB of VRAM will suffice if you want to play most games at medium settings at 1080p, but it will fall short if you want to crank things up a notch. 12GB of VRAM, on the other hand, provides you a lot more headroom and is significantly more future-proof, which is ideal when next-generation console games start to make transitions to PC. Anything above 12GB is really only recommended for the most high-end cards and is only required if you need to play or edit videos at 4K or higher HDs. GPU and Memory Clock Speed The clock speeds of both the cores and memory are the other piece of the GPU performance puzzle. This is the number of complete computation cycles that the card can perform each second, and it's where any gaps in core or memory can end up being bridged, sometimes dramatically. It's also the best place to go if you want to overclock your graphics card. Base clock and boost clock are the two most common metrics of clock speed. Whenever the card is stressed, it will try to run at a boost clock, which is the lowest clock speed that it should run at. On the other hand, thermal and power needs may prevent it from reaching that clock frequently for long periods. And as a result, MD cards also have a game clock, which is more realistic than the typical clock speed that you'll see while gaming. The RTX 2080 Super and 2080 Ti are examples of how clock speeds may make an impact. Even though the 2080 Ti has about 50% more cores than the 2080 Super, it's only about 10 to 30% slower depending on the game. This is due to the fact that most 3080 Supers have a clock speed of around 300 megahertz, which means it has more than the 2080 Ti. It also does help to have a better memory. Memory performance is measured in bandwidth, which is computed by multiplying the memory speed by its total capacity. The RTX 3080's faster GDDR6X memory helps to boost overall bandwidth by about 20% over the RTX 2080 and RTX 2080 Ti. However, there is a limit to how beneficial a card can be, with cards like the AMD Radeon 7 providing massive bandwidth but lesser gaming performance than the 3080. Clock speeds should only be evaluated once you've decided on a model when purchasing a graphics card. Factory overclocks are available on some GPU models, which can boost performance by a few percentage points above the competition, and it can be considerable if there is adequate cooling. Cooling and Power A card's power is limited by its cooling and power draw. If you don't keep your graphics card at a safe working temperature, it is going to restrict its clock speed, resulting in drastically lower performance. And it can also result in more noise as the fans are spinning faster and faster to attempt to cool it down. Although coolers do greatly differ from one card to the next and from one manufacturer to the next, a reasonable rule of thumb is that the cards with larger heat sinks and much more larger fans are way better cooled. And that means they're quieter and in many cases, faster. If you're interested in overclocking, this may allow you to do so. Aftermarket cooling sections, such as large heat sinks and in extreme circumstances, water cooling, can help to make cards even quieter and cooler. It's worth noting though that changing the cooler on a GPU is far more difficult than changing the cooler on a CPU. Low noise cooling may not be as important, that is if you play with headsets, but it is still something to think about when designing or purchasing a PC. What you need to do is focus on whether your PSU has adaptable wattage to support the new card whenever it comes into power. It would also be best to double check that your power supply has the appropriate cables for the card that you do end up planning to purchase. Some adapters could do the job, but they're not so reliable, and if you need one, it's a sign that your power supply is just not up to the job. So there you have it, folks. That's all you need to know about choosing the right GPU that's going to help you have the best gaming experience. Thanks for watching today's video. We encourage you to like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. And as always, guys, until next time, stay safe and stay informed.